When we say God is good, what do we mean? Sometimes we can have these things that we say and, and they, they can become meaningless or we can kind of fail to, to see the, the fullness of what we're saying. I want to spend several weeks on this one attribute <clears throat> and there are at least three reasons why I want to do that. First of all, because it is so important in our faith and understanding of who God is. If God is not good, why would we believe in him? Why would we trust him? Secondly, because Thanksgiving Day is coming soon, and God's goodness is at the heart of all of our thanksgiving, all of our praise and giving thanks. The goodness of God is at the heart of that. And then the third reason <clears throat> is because God's goodness is so severely attacked in our day. The so-called new atheists have become very aggressive in their accusations against God, specifically against God's goodness. These accusations follow the pattern of the serpent in Eden, who questioned and attacked the goodness of God. And Eve listened, was tempted, and responded to those temptations. And primarily their accusations involve some of the attributes of God that we've already talked about so far. For instance, they will say, how can God be good, all-knowing, and all-powerful, and allow such suffering, abuse, and evil to exist in this world? How can you believe in a good God? Well, the reasoning is actually off in, in certain ways. These accusations come from, a re, first of all, a rejection that there is a creator at all. Because if there is a creator who started it all, then we must recognize him for his, the position that he has and the authority that he has and our responsibility to him. But they reject that there's a, there is a creator. Secondly, they're selective in God's activity that they speak about. Because there's a, there's a lot around us, if we have eyes to see, that testify of how good God is. But they don't mention that. They mention the things that are wrong and evil in the world. And thirdly, they reason from a human perspective that elevates humans, human desire and human will, as supreme. Uh, th that is, this is the most important thing in all the universe is humans, their desires, and their will. And then fourth, they believe their idea of justice and righteousness is superior to all others, which they are saying by their judgment that that's the basis for their judging of everyone else, in, including God. Now, we can easily be intimidated or at least distracted by these accusations against God. Uh, sometimes even our own circumstances can be so hard for us that we question God's goodness. But we know he's good, but sometimes it's, some doubt creeps in. But when we open up the scriptures, it is clear that any belief in God rests on believing that God is good. We cannot know God without believing in his goodness. God's goodness affects all his attributes and is foundational to who God is. So when we say God is good, there's, there's a depth to what we're saying. Understanding God's goodness has some very powerful and practical implications for our life. What we believe about God shapes every decision that we make. It shapes every motive and every response, every action, every attitude, every thought. In fact, every aspect of your life is shaped by what you think about God. Even those who reject God, their life is shaped by what they believe about God. Well, this morning we want to begin by defining God's goodness from the Bible. What does the scripture say about God and his goodness? I want to give you seven truths this morning about God's goodness. 
And if you have notes, they're right there, the seven points, and you can uh, follow along and fill in the blanks there. Number one, God is good by nature. God is good by nature. Psalm 107, verse 1 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. The scriptures repeat this, this same thought, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, in Psalm 106, 1, Psalm 118, 1, Psalm 118, 29, and Psalm 136, 1. All of that, those verses say the same thing. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. You notice Psalm 107, verse 8. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness, for his wonderful works to the children of men. So, give thanks to the Lord, he is good. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness. Oh, that we would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness, that we would have eyes to see around us the goodness of God everywhere. Because the scripture says clearly that God is good. And if we believe in the God of the Bible, then we must believe that he is good because the Bible says it over and over again. Let me give you some more. And I'm going to go through these fast and this is going to be coming up here, so hopefully they can keep up with me. Psalm 25, verse 8. Good and upright is the Lord. <clears throat> Psalm 86, 5. For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive. Psalm 100, verse 5. For the Lord is good. That's repeated in Nehemiah, uh, excuse me, not Nehemiah, Nahum 1, 7 and Jeremiah 33, 11. Psalm 135, 3. Praise the Lord, for he is good. Psalm 143, 10. Your spirit is good. And then, then Exodus chapter 34, verse 6. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. <clears throat> the testimony of the scripture is that God is good. Stephen Charnock, in his classic, The Existence and Attributes of God, has said this, and I quote, we cannot conceive him God unless we conceive him the highest good, having nothing superior to himself in goodness as he hath nothing superior to himself in excellency and perfection. No man can possibly form a notion of God in his mind and yet form a notion of something better than God. End of quote. So he's saying there, if indeed you have a notion of God, you cannot have a notion of something better. You can't have a notion of God without a no, an understanding of his goodness. And then Thomas Manton, who uh, was a 17th century Puritan preacher in London and England, says this, speaking of God's goodness, he is originally good, good of himself, which nothing is. For all creatures are good only by participation and communication from God. He is essentially good, not only good, but goodness itself. The creature's good is a superadded quality. In God, it is his essence. Both of these men are saying, God is good by nature. He is good. That's who he is. He is original good. He is the source of all good, as it is his very being that is good without anything in him that is contrary to good. He is not good because he does good. He does good because he is good. Good by nature. Therefore, whatever God says is good. Whatever God does is good. Whatever God thinks is good. Whatever God desires is good. Whatever his motives are, they are good. He is all good he is only good. He is good by nature. That is who God is. Secondly, God alone is good. Matthew 19, 17. Jesus is responding to the rich young ruler who has come to him and said, Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? 
No one is good but one, that is God. So the testimony of Jesus is that there is no one in all the universe that is good but God. He alone is good. Good or goodness is defined by God. He is the only being in existence that is inherently good, uniquely good. He is, as we have talked about, he is holy. He is perfect. We may say of some other person, some other man, he's a, he's a good man. You've said that, right? He's a good man. But what we are saying is, he's a good man in comparison to other men. But that is only by comparison. That is not by nature. God is the standard. He is the source and the only being that is good by nature that alone is good. Good or goodness has no meaning or definition without God. Good in one sense defines God. In another sense, God defines good. I want you to listen carefully. If there is no God, as the new atheists profess, then there is no standard of goodness. I'm going to repeat that. If there is no God, then there is no standard of goodness because everyone has their own standard of what they consider good. And when those standards contradict, then who is right? Where is the standard that we come back to that says, this is good, this is goodness, if there is no God? You see, the idea that, that everyone's standard of goodness is is how we are to live and and is the standard for goodness, has led us to a Hitler who believed he was doing something good when he persecuted the Jews and tried uh, tried to wipe them out. He thought he was doing good. And those who followed him uh, believed him as well. Or it leads to a Stalin who also destroyed many people It it leads to what's going on in North Korea. It leads to all sorts of of things that are, are very evil and terrible, but that are justified as if they are good. You see, what happens if there is no God and and therefore no standard of goodness, then there's some other authority then that takes, its, takes God's place and becomes the standard of goodness. In our day, in America, pretty much that standard of what is good and what is bad has become the Supreme Court. And so if there's a ruling from the Supreme Court, even if God says it's evil, our society says it's good because there is no standard if everyone is the standard. But some authority will come along and push its way to the front and force you into their standard of goodness. And that is what is happening today. To know God is to know goodness. To reject God is to reject goodness. Hebrews 11, 6 tells us, for he who comes to God must believe that he is. And the Bible testifies that he is good. If you are to come to God, you must understand that he is good and he alone is good. There's no competition here. There is no, you know, someone else that's, that's you know, almost the same. No, he, he alone is good. By nature, he is good. So by what standard of goodness can we judge God? If we're all free to choose our own standard, there is no standard. So how can we judge God since there is no standard to judge him by? He is the standard. We have no standard by which we can judge God except how we feel or how we think. 
And everybody has this different idea of what the standard is. It's also, uh, often Christians get blamed or accused of being rigid or negative or hard because we believe that God is right. We believe, the, we believe in the scripture. We, we believe that God defines what is good and what is evil. And that, and that his definition is the only right definition, it's the only standard that there is. But I have found, and I think that y- you will agree with me here, that people who judge others by their own standard are the most legalistic, intolerant, and condemning of all people. And it's all over social media now. In Matthew chapter 15, verse 9, it says, And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. In other words, they they take their own standard and they, they try to define me by their own standard. The scriptures affirm that God alone is good, that he defines good, and no standard of goodness can define him. When we stand in judgment of God, we are accusing ourselves of trying to take God's place, of trying to be the standard of goodness that only God is. God is good, and he only is good. Number three, God's goodness fills the earth. Psalm 33, verse 5. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. Everywhere you look on this planet, from the depths of the ocean to the heights of the clouds, everywhere you look on this planet, is a testimony to the goodness of God. You say, well, there's a lot of things that are wrong and bad. Well, there are. That's true. That's true. Which testifies even more to the goodness of God. His goodness is displayed throughout creation, not only in this world, but in in the heavens. As we look into the heavens, we see the goodness and glory of God. What God has made, the way he has made it, the way he has made it function, and the way he orders it displays the amazing goodness of God. I'm not going to go any further on this point because we're going to pick this up in a later message about the goodness of God in creation. But right now, I just want you to, to settle this, that the Bible says the earth is full of the goodness of God and we need to ask God to open our eyes to be able to see his goodness all around us. To see his goodness on display, even to evil men, he shows his goodness. Because the sun rises on the good and on the evil. The rain comes to both the good and the evil. That is, to the just, to those who have been justified by faith. Number four, God's goodness is rich. God's goodness is rich. Paul speaks of this in Romans 2, verse 4. Do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? He speaks here of the riches of his goodness. And he speaks of his forbearance and long-suffering as well. But specifically, I want to focus on his goodness. This word riches, plutos is the Greek term, means abundance or fullness. In other words, God's goodness is not stingy. It's not even frugal. It's lavish. It's extravagant. It is rich. The goodness of God is rich. Rich in its extent. 
Because the Bible says that the earth is full of the, of the goodness of God. Since it's full of the goodness of God, then God's goodness extends everywhere. Everywhere you can go on this planet, you'll find God's goodness displayed. It is rich in its consistency. We mentioned already the sunrise. There's a consistency in the sunrise, isn't there? In fact, many of you watch the news and, and as the weather comes on, they quite often will bring up the time of the sunrise and the time of the sunset. Well, how do they know that? Because it's always consistent from what it was previously and, and as they figure out the, the day's shortening. And in fact, they'll start at the beginning of the month and they'll tell you how many, how many minutes we're going to lose this month. And so how much shorter the days will be at the end of the month than they are at the beginning of the month. How do they know that? Because there's a consistency about creation, the way God has created it. He did that out of his goodness. There's a consistency there. In both Matthew 5, 45, which speaks of the sun rising on the, on the just and the unjust and, on, and the rain coming on the just and the unjust. And in Psalm 19, 1 through 3, the heavens declare the glory of God. The testimony of that is everywhere in this earth. Also, the, the, the goodness of God is rich in its generosity. When God came to earth, you know what the testimony was of Jesus? He went about doing good. He went about doing good. When God came to earth, what did he do? He did good. He did good wherever he went. Whoever he was with, he did good. The testimony of the richness of the goodness of God. And of course, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, Yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. There's a richness in the goodness of God. A richness that he has to give. And he's not stingy in giving that goodness. And he's rich in what he gives. This verse in Romans chapter 2 verse 4 that we started this, this section with speaks about something God gives. He gives repentance. The repentance comes to us out of God's goodness. That's what leads us to repentance. And this is a good thing. It is good to repent. It is, it is out of his goodness that we're able to repent. It is because God is good to us that he turns us away from our sin and turns us to himself. So God's goodness is rich, it is lavish, it's extravagant, it's overflowing. In everything that he does, his goodness spills out, his goodness is seen and, and displayed. Number five, God's goodness satisfies. God's goodness satisfies. Jeremiah 31, verse 14. I will satiate the soul of the priests with abundance, and my people shall be satisfied with my goodness, says the Lord. People will be satisfied with my goodness. This is similar to what he says in Psalm 107, verse 9. For he satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. The goodness of God brings satisfaction to our soul. Notice he says here in Jeremiah 31, 14, that the soul of the priest will be satiated with abundance. In other words, it's gonna, there is a richness for the soul. And he's, he's speaking of a time when Christ returns and when the final restoration of the nation of Israel and the priests in that day will be satiated. In other words, filled overflowing with the riches that God provides, riches for their soul. 
And then the people that the priests are ministering to will be satisfied with God's goodness. Do you know that God's goodness is the only thing that will satisfy your soul? That's why sometimes your soul is restless because you're doubting the goodness of God. But when you see and understand the goodness of God, your soul is, is at peace. There's a rest and a satisfaction there. It's something that evil cannot do. Evil will never satisfy. Sin will never satisfy. The soul is satisfied in God alone. It is not satisfied with anything else. It's the way God made us. And without God, the soul is restless and discontent and always striving for something else to satisfy. Evil is a dry well. And people go there for a drink and there's nothing to drink. And they can't understand why their soul feels empty and their soul feels this need for something else and something more. Because the something more that it needs is God. The goodness of God satisfies. I hope you've learned that and have experienced that personally. Number six, God's goodness displays his glory. God's goodness displays his glory. So when you see his goodness, you're seeing God, you're seeing his glory displayed to you. Exodus 33, verse 19. And this is Moses who has just asked God to show him his glory. And this is God's response. Then he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you. And I'll proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I'll be gracious to whom I'll be gracious. And I'll have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So when when Moses asked to see God's glory, what was God's response? He says, I'll make all my goodness pass before you. Because it's his goodness that is his glory. That's what we see. We see the goodness of God. That is what we experience. We experience the goodness of God. And that's God on display to us. It brings us, brings God glory. So God told him he'd make all his goodness pass before him. And so God descended and proclaimed the name of the Lord. We mentioned the verse back in in Exodus. Where was it? Exodus chapter 34, verse 35. No, no, it's 34. 34 verse 6. This is what the Lord said when, when he came by Moses and showed him his glory, the backside of his glory. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long suffering and abounding in goodness. That's his glory. Can you see it? Can you see how good God has been to you? Can you see how good he has been to to people who are evil and rebellious against him? Can you see that his goodness is everywhere you look? You look into the heavens, you see it. Wherever you look, you see the goodness of God. And so he said his goodness displays his glory. I encourage you to make every effort to understand, to trust and appreciate, and to live in the reality that God is good because as you see his goodness and as you praise his goodness, God is glorified, God is displayed, God is seen. One more point. Six points. You didn't know I could go through them this quick, did you? <laughs> did, a lot of, did a lot of editing this week. <clears throat> Number seven. God's goodness is to be feared. And this is an interesting part of this whole subject. God's goodness is to be feared. Hosea... 3, 5. This is also speaking of a time when Israel is restored in Christ's kingdom. 
Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter day. It seems kind of strange to us. Why would it be important to fear the goodness of the Lord? You would think that would be something that we would not fear, but rejoice over. Well, we do indeed rejoice over it, but there's a reason to fear. Because the Lord is good and is the standard of goodness. Because he's rich in goodness, which satisfies our souls, because he displays this goodness everywhere we look, we should fear that we might miss out on his goodness by failing to trust him. Or that we would misinterpret God's goodness. Let me explain what I mean by that. The passage in Romans that we looked at, Romans chapter 2, verse 4, mentioned about despising the, the goodness, forbearance, and long suffering of God. Not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. So, in the goodness of God, He convicts us of sin. That's his goodness. He points out to you where you are wrong. Where you have failed him. He shows you his standard of goodness and shows you that you have not measured up to his standard of goodness and that's his goodness that does that. Now it may not feel like goodness. It may feel like it hurts. It may feel... Like you don't want to hear anymore. Like you, you just want to turn from that and, and go back to justifying yourself and, and hoping that you, you look good before others. But it is the goodness of God that reveals to us our sin. Has God revealed your sin to you? Then praise God for His goodness. Because that's His goodness. And it leads you to repentance. It leads you to turn from the sin and to turn to God. But the opposite of God's goodness leading us to repentance is God's wrath. Do you know what God does in his wrath? you know what his wrath looks like? And this is where some people misunderstand his wrath and think it is his goodness and approval. The wrath of God is giving you what you want in your flesh. It's turning you over to the thing that you want in your flesh. That's his wrath. And so there are people who say, well, God made me this way and want to celebrate that. But in reality, no, God didn't make you that way. Sin made you that way. And that's not the goodness and approval of God on your life because he's giving you over to that. That's his wrath. That's his anger against you and his judgment against you. Because the goodness of God displayed in your life points out that you are wrong, that you have measured up to his standard, that you have failed and that you need to repent and be saved. So we should fear the goodness of God. Amen? We should fear that we'd miss out on the goodness of God. That we'd misinterpret the goodness of God. That we'd think his wrath is his goodness when in reality it is not his goodness. It is the absence of his goodness. Because when, you, when, when a person dies without Christ and they go to hell, you know what hell is? Hell is an absence of the goodness of God. It's only his wrath. His wrath unmixed with anything else. We, we don't have hell on earth because we still have the goodness of God here. We still enjoy the goodness of God here. It's still all around us. It's displayed everywhere. But in hell, it won't be there. It won't be there. It'll be nothing but unmixed 
wrath. It's a horrible, horrible place and a horrible thought. So we should fear that we would miss the goodness of God by failing to repent, by failing to listen to words of his goodness to us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. His words to us that there is none good, no, not one. The none righteous is none who seek God. We hear that we say, oh, well, that's maybe true about others, but not me. Don't miss the goodness of God. He's telling you those things because he wants to display his goodness. He wants you to lead. He wants to lead you to repentance, to turn from those things that are evil and that bring God's judgment and to turn to him in humble repentance. The goodness of God is to be feared. We should fear that we might despise God's goodness and and fail to repent. In other words, if we fail to repent, we're despising God's goodness. If, If you reject that message that he sends to you, that you are a sinner in need of being saved, and you need to turn from that sin and turn to Jesus to be saved, you need to repent. If you reject that message, you're you're despising the goodness of God. And you're under his wrath. You should fear that. Because the Bible says that God now is calling all men everywhere to repent. Repent. In Acts chapter 17, verses 30 and 31, truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by his standard, that is, his standard of righteousness, not ours, by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. There's coming a day when God will, by his standard of goodness and righteousness, judge every single person by his standard, not your standard, not the society's standard, not the Supreme Court standard. By his standard, he will judge all the world, every person. And he will do that by Jesus Christ. But now... At this moment, in his goodness, he is calling you to repentance. Fear. Fear that you might miss that. That you'd fail to repent and miss the goodness of God. And end in an eternity under the wrath of God. In his goodness, God sent Jesus to save, not to condemn. For God did not send his son, John 3, 17, he did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And he who comes to God must believe that he is. He is good. He is good. And the times when he doesn't feel good to you, he is still good. The things that come into your life that that you feel are not good are his goodness leading you to repentance. And I want you to understand that even once we are saved, once we've repented of our sin and believed in Jesus Christ, repentance is something that goes on continuously in our life because we continue to sin and he continues to reveal our sin to us and turn us from it. Don't despise that. And so if we, come, if we come to him believing that he is, we must believe that he is good and that in his goodness he has revealed our sin. In his goodness he is calling us to repentance. In his goodness he's calling us to his son whom he sent not to condemn the world but to save. In his, in his goodness he's, he's saying to you, this is what you have lived for all your life and it's wrong. But there's a way out through Jesus Christ. But you must turn away and turn to him. Fear that you might miss that. That's the goodness of God. Let's pray. 
Father, this morning we are humbled before you. As humans, we have such a tendency to judge you, to judge the things in our life that are good or bad. You alone are the standard. We are not. Forgive us for trying to take your place. So Father, as we have sought to define your goodness from your word, help us to see, the, help us to see it, help us to, to experience your goodness. To, to look around us and, and to see how it's on display everywhere we look. To have eyes to see and ears to hear. And Father, I pray for all who are gathered here under the sound of my voice. We, we just pray, Lord, that there would be none here who would miss out on God's goodness by failing to repent. But this morning, by your grace and in your mercy, that you would call them to yourself, that you would humble them before you and, and give them the grace to believe in Jesus Christ and to be saved. And for us who know you, Father, I pray that we would live under your goodness. That we would not be judging you or others by our own standard, but that we would submit to your standard. And that we would stand in your truth. And that we would love you with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength that we would experience repentance on a regular basis as you reveal to us our sin and our fleshly ways and turn us from it. Praise you for your goodness, and especially your goodness in sending your son, Jesus Christ, to this earth to be the one and only Savior. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.